welcome everyone and welcome Abe. So as others are joining, we can just start and I hope that you have also a tutor on the call as well. So it's your time Abe to just start the tutorial session. Hello. So yeah, I'm Abebo from Adludo. So I was also from Teen Academy. I was, I was actually student of batch two. Now I'm working in company in London as senior data scientist. So yeah, I will be giving like a kind of short talk on sequential A/B testing. So it's it's not kind of that much deep. Uh, technical thing, so I will just highlight how it works, why we have to deal with such uh, like algorithm instead of the usual classical approach, the conventional A-B testing approach that we are always dealing with, and also give you some kind of starter code that allow you to begin and understand the concept behind the algorithm, and you are expected to work on top of it. So let me share my screen. So, I hope you all can see my screen, right? Yeah, we can see. Okay, awesome. So, let me go back. How many of you are new to A-B testing? I heard about the previous tutorial session. Okay. Oh. So yeah, I mean, the aim of the session is actually just to motivate you and also you all are expected to explore more and bring questions so that we can discuss in a group base and like find more interesting ideas behind the algorithm, implement it, test it in uh, the challenge that you will be working on and come up with some amazing results. So I heard already about the tutorial that you took last time on conventional A-B testing, like general A-B testing and the machine learning application behind. So I, I'll start with actually like asking you the same refresher question. So who can help me to by uh, defining A-B testing? Thanks, Martin. Go ahead, Martin, yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, so A-B testing is when uh, we, we test for different, for two variants. Oh, sorry. Uh, is when we test, when we carry out an experiment where we test two variants, that is A and B, against each other mm -hmm. to evaluate uh, which one performs better in a randomized experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, so it forms uh, more or less like a binomial distribution. Thank you. Thanks. Michael, do you have something to add? Yeah, uh, okay. it's like, yeah. Uh, when, let me describe it um, on the business side. Like A B testing is we have A sample and B sample, and then we will test. We, we will test. Uh, we, we will do some uh, variable. We will give it some variable, and we will see the effect of that variable that did that that has an effect on our on our sample A. And we will check without giving anything on to the sample B, and we will we will we will based on our uh, based on our confidence level or based on our significance level, we will we will take uh, our best sample, and we will find out that the variable has has got a positive result on it. That's how I understood it. Thanks. I think both of you said it. Yes, it's all the same thing, but different ways. Uh, expression. So, yeah. Tade, do you want to add more? Yes, a little bit. Okay. okay. 
Good morning, as uh, I have uh, understood from one reference that you have provided us. It is uh, about comparing two versions of something, just to mm -hmm. figure out which performs better. For example, you can provide the user or the uh, people who, give, who will give you the feedback, two things, and uh, comparing that variables. Thanks. So, yeah, I think, yeah, it's, it's all as you said. So let me give you one easy example. So let's say we wanted to test the conversion rate from, I mean, just to know uh, the number of visitors to our website, the reason behind the number of visitors to our website. So let's say we released version one website a couple of a week ago, and we are tracking our visitors data. And again, like after two weeks, we modified the uh, website, let's say we changed some color or could be some any kind of styling in the page. Then we wanted to see which version of our product is more uh, bringing more purchase intention or which product is uh, like our clients more want to see. So, I mean, Without the statistics, yeah, I mean, we can not believe that just by counting number of people who is visiting, uh, yeah, we are getting this result because of uh, the change we made. But that's not true, right? There are a lot of factors that should be measured and also statistically determined to say this product is better than that one. So in that scenario, what we are doing with A-B testing is we are trying to find the change that is uh, that we are seeing now is statistically significant to say is coming from variant A or variant B. So that's all about A-B testing. So it's just to minimize the gas and we are, we are applying some statistical technique to find out the conversion that we are getting currently is coming from which version. To say that it's coming from variant A, we should have some kind of statistical uh, practice that we are applying and uh, the conclusion sh should have some sort of statistical significance itself. So yeah, that's all about comp just doing some statistical uh, hypothesis testing to get the changes coming exactly from uh, just to say, just to minimize the error rate. So let's say if we just blindly say, I mean like variant A is better than variant B. And if we miss to consider the factors behind that specific product, could it be, uh, let's say the time that we release the product may matter, right? It's not the product itself, maybe the time, the period we release the product may matter just to visit uh, different, Visitor to our page. So, yeah, that is where the statistical analysis plays its role. So, we have to do some statistical analysis and get exact error from the uh, data and define the confidence level that the change is exactly coming from X or Y. That's the, the idea behind all the A B testing. So, yeah, why we need it is already mentioned, but I again invite you to say a few words about how to apply that A-B testing. So I know you, you all, all of you have some ideas because you were, uh, I can see you all in the challenge document too. So just to uh, give you a context before deep dive into the new paradigm. Mm, I would love if someone other than Martin or some other members can give, participate here. But if no one is raising hand, is your room, Martin? Okay, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so, a bit testing the procedure of how it's actually done is you will first of all get a component called the baseline conversion rate, and the baseline conversion rate is basically the uh, is a percentage like between the people who turned or or who accepted 
in the control group uh, over the total number of members in the control group. And once you find your baseline conversion rate, you also calculate uh, uh, the, you, you also need your minimum de detector, detectable effect, which they call the MDE. Then you calculate the sample size uh, for, for you to be able to get something uh, that is uh, meaningful. And once you've completed uh, calculating your sample size and you've gotten your BCR and you've gotten your MDE, the next thing is you just drive uh, traffic to your variations until you reach the target sample for each variation. Then you can now carry out the evaluation of the results. So uh, once, you, once you just have these figures correct, then you can carry out the, the A-B test and you can evaluate your results. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, now, anyone? Anyone? Okay, so then let's get back to the concept then. So I, I saw one important question, how to calculate the sample size. So who wanted to answer this question? Yeah, Daisy, please. Um, thank you, I could try um, to calculate the sample size. Yesterday, um, Anastasia, Anastasia was using a tool called optimizely.com so that it does the calculation for you online. Yeah, I'm also sending you one more link here. So that there are actually supporting tools that helps you to define some um, sample size. That's that's actually basic problem behind the conventional algorithm that we are using. And sometimes the sample size that uh, tools may suggest you to use may not give you still the significance uh, conclusion to say the uh, either to accept or to reject the hypothesis that we designed at the initial phase. So yeah, we can use some tools. They use some kind of like best practices to calculate the uh, estimates. So you define, let's say, if in this tool. So yeah, when you give some kind of baseline and the MDE, then it will suggest to you the number of like data that you are expected to use in both of the um, variants, either treatment or the experiment or the control group. Uh, yeah, that, that's all about the way how we do. So as they said, we should have two, day, two uh, observable products first. So it could be product or something we wanted to test. Then we have to track data for those of, both of the uh, variants we have. The data tracking should also depend on the sample size that we initially defined. So that's why actually the, the need of today's discussion is to minimize this waiting time that we take to collect that all data until the sample size reach. So imagine for the big company with millions of visitors or like data coming streaming, tracking that all data and uh, waiting for the maximum size which is defined by the tool is not something that you can afford. There are a lot of issues that may rise. Cost could be an issue, one of, one of an issue. So, but whatever it is with conventional approach or like the classical A-B testing approach, the primary thing is defining the sample size. So once you have that defined sample size, you track the data, and convert that to binomial observation 
then once that's then you apply some statistical uh, A-B testing just to find the error rates, the type one, the type two error rate. Then you would define the confidence level to say that variant A is uh, like outperform variant B. Is that significant, sig like statistically significant or not? So your hypothesis maybe it could be one side just to test variant. You already believe that variant A or the previous change is uh, good than the next one. So this is one side test. You are only trying to test the like the validity of your A is greater than B formula. But if it is two sided, you have to test in both directions. So it should give the same statistically significant result in both direction to accept the hypothesis so that you may conclude with both both variant has no change. It's just it's coming from some uh, different thing behind. And also the reverse may be true. In the one side, you may do either A to B or B to A, but in both sides, A B testing, you have to apply the test in both uh, direction and you come up with the expected result. So saying this, so as I uh, tried to mention with these two A-B testing, uh, with two variants uh, we have, so we have to collect the data to say the conversion rate we identified is exactly true. So here, let's say this is the thing that we are getting. With variant A, we had kind of 25% conversion with Variant B, 70% conversion. Conversion could be could be a purchasing station, it could be the visitor, number of just counting number of visitors in the page. Depends on the key performance indicator you set and from the very beginning to measure the product you have. So with this, you can simply say, yeah, my variant A is nice and we are getting this much conversion. Let's keep this uh, variant B over variant B. That's not true, right? That's not a statistically significant thing. You have to test what's the, uh, like you have to identify the error rate behind uh, this change. So the change may be coming because of some ex external factors that we are seeing. So to do so, you should come up with some fixed size, sample size data, and you have to track, you have to run first this all independently both of the algorithm, both of the products you have independently, distribute that to the user, collect the data until you get the sample size, which is uh, preset. So once you have that all sample size data, then you apply statistical uh, analysis over that and they come up with the final uh, decision. So that's how the conventional A-B testing works. But the problem is, so from the uh, experiment, just to track, even just to collect the sample size. So some companies uh, may run the same product, two similar product for a week. Some may run for a month. It may, some may run for multiple months just to get significantly, I mean, the statistically significant result from the expected result. Imagine the time that we post, let's say we deployed in the AWS environment just to run this data collection for the experiment. This is not the real product. This is just a test that we deployed and collecting. The, the users are the same. They are the real users, but the aim is not to uh, toward this uh, objective. Rather, the aim is just to, to do the in our uh, product. So, it may cost us, like, it may bring some big cost, right? That's something we don't want to see in the company from business perspective. But not only that, in some cases, especially in uh, medical, uh, in medicine or in some pharmacy related analysis. So there is some ethical issues also, ethical issue may rise also. So let's say, while we are running, while you are running the two variant data for uh, just to track the data for the two variant, let's say in the uh, third, let's say in the third day, that the, we may get the significant, I mean, we know the problem with, okay, let me give you the context. So with a conventional algorithm, 
So we, we can't run the main algorithm or the one that we wanted to find the statistical uh, significant result at the middle of the data traffic phase. We have to wait until all the data is collected um, to the uh, expected sample size. So at that moment, let's say we may get the significant like uh, statistical significant result at the middle of the data tracking phase. But because of the algorithm does not allow us to do that, we have to wait for that. So in medical scenario, there are some ethical issues that may rise usually. So it's not actually ethically acceptable in medical uh, department to continue an exper experiment that may have some determinal effect. Just easy to deny or accept the uh, hypothesis that we designed initially. But because of the predetermined sample size, we have to wait and run it again and again. That's that there is the concept of an ethical issues there also. But the important thing here in our case is the cost. So there are two cost issues here. One is the actual cost that the cost that we uh, we should pay of for the data collection phase, and the other one is the opportunity cost. So this is business, right? So because of the time it takes to collect the enough size, we may miss some important important opportunity of uh, that the product may bring for us. So because of these two issues, there is the need to do just running the test for any or every coming trials or data stream that we are collecting. That is why we call it as sequential. So we do the test sequentially, we test it again and again till we get the, uh, either we reject or we accept the hypothesis that we designed initially. So sequential A-B testing is actually it do in like kind of non-traditional way so as I said, instead of waiting for the simple, the fixed size data, we choose an item at a time, like drag an item from the collection, then test the hypothesis, then we have to come up with the three things. One is if we are, if the result is showing the uh, statistically significant to say, either to reject or accept the hypothesis, we reject or accept it, but it is not reachable at that time, we have to keep like tracking the data, do the hypothesis, tracking the data, do the hypothesis. So the loop continues until we come up with the uh, expected uh, result. So yeah, that's the main idea behind the testing. It's not actually changing the way how we compute this type one and the type two errors in the sample that size that we collected, rather changing the uh, like the ideology behind waiting for fixed sample size data to uh, come up with the final expected uh, conclusion. So yeah, there are a lot of algorithms in this sequential A-B testing. So it's a little bit uh, too technical and also beyond the scope of the, not only the tutor, also the objective of the uh, I mean, the week also. So what I will do, I will just highlight some of it and give you the starter notebook that I uh, wrote in Python for this particular uh, tutorial. You, you are expected to go through the notebook, understand the code. The, I try to add some comments and detailed things to look into and also add some references of the code component. So you are expected to go through all, all of the uh, like sections in the code and raise the questions if you have, I will come back or give you like a kind of, maybe we can interact in, in, some, in some step if we want more in that scenario. So, uh, but from here, from variants of sequential testing, so, the very popular ones are these two. One is the Wallace's uh, sequential probability ratio test, which is the kind of likelihood uh, test, likelihood, uh, likelihood ratio kind of computation, no different thing, the same thing that we do for the other A-B testing. But 
the way different. So what we do here is, so we take the observation first, we have to convert the data that we are tracking into kind of binomial nature, the series of zeros and ones, saying we, once that series of zeros and one values are tracked, we have to do, observe, like we pick the pair from the two, we convert that into one pair, just one and the zero pair, then we try to apply the uh, Wallis formula there to find the, the confidence level of, to say the, I mean, to say the pair that we take at that time are statistically significant to decide either to reject or accept the hypothesis. So the problem here is, in real scenario, we wanted to do like two binomial proportions, not single one. So there are scenarios that may we, we may apply while this uh, sequential probability ratio test, but in real scenario, let's say the, the problem that I raised here, kind of, we have two uh, variants. So for, for both of the data, we should have, let's say, we are just rating viewer yes or no kind of viewer data for both of uh, variant A and variant B, we should have zero and one, yes and no scenario. So in that scenario, since it's going to remove the, like, the, the relationship between the two different uh, variant data we have, so we are not usually using this kind of well, this SPRT for when we have multiple observations and we wanted to compare the relationship between the two and come up with the final uh, decision to say which one is better than uh, the two observations we have. But in that case, we have to look for conditional, uh, this sequential probability ratio test. It helps us to, so it's, it's also the same, it's also likelihood uh, ratio probability test, nothing else, but it is the conditional. Given this condition, it one tries to find, given X tries to find the relation between Y and Z kind of uh, computation. But the problem here is, again, we have to convert the, the data series we have, the zeros and the one series data we have into one equally sized binomial data series. So. At that time, I, I will come back with the algorithm when we discuss about conditional SPR. That's the one that the, your notebooks also designed for. So you will see where you have to play, where to truncate the time series data just to prepare the two different observations without losing the expected information. So let me take you here. I have some sort of... Um, descriptions here. So yeah, this is just from theoretical perspective. But the idea is in both of the conditional and the uh, normal spatial probability ratio test, there are five steps. So first, we have to collect the data. We have to convert that into binomial series a kind of Bernoulli series with zeros and the one series for both of those observations. Then we have to calculate the upper and lower decision boundary. So it's like, it's nothing alpha. Uh, actually, just so let me, let me take you to the, just to give you the context of how the formula behind is working. So, Yeah, I thought it's there, but yeah, let, let, let me give you context in this graph only. So we have to uh, calculate, so there is the formula to calculate the upper and the lower boundary. So once we calculate that, that's actually to show where the, the main part is lying, where the statistical test is lying. So is that above this line or below this line? So what's the boundary? So we wanted to dry, draw a line that cross these two. So if it is crossing the above boundary line that we drawn from the random uh, like statistical thing that we are doing, if it is touching the above, the uh, upper boundary we designed, 
we are looking for rejection boundary, but it, if we are just below the lower boundary, so we are looking for the acceptance uh, boundary Z. So, so there we are trying to find upper and lower uh, limit, the decision boundaries in the data. Then we do some cumulative sum between. So as I said, we have two observation rights. We do cumulative sum of the observation that we uh, randomly picked from the data we have. Then we do the likelihood ratio test over that. Then based on the decision boundary we have, so we try to calculate using this like conditional likelihood ratio, we are trying to calculate the upper and the lower limit for the exposed group data we have. Then if the data is like going or like the point that you find in every series data, in every data, if the point is touching the, above, the upper boundary we have, so we are likely to say we are rejecting our hypothesis. If it is touching the bottom line, we are likely to say we are accepting the initial hypothesis we have. But the stopping rule that guide us to stop the testing is this one. So if the log probability ratio is greater than or equal to the upper critical uh, limits, which is actually the line that we drawn at the very beginning, so we're gonna reject the null hypothesis, which is actually, it's, it's not actually rejecting the null hypothesis is uh, not to say accepting actually the alternative hypothesis, right? So we are saying it's statistically significant to look into null hypothesis than the uh, alternative hypothesis. And we can conclude that version two is better than version one. With that significance, the, the confidence level, level we determined only, not uh, like it's in the real world, it's not, it may not be, but the data is saying that. And we terminate the test or if the log probability ratio is that we determine this less than or equal to the lower critical limit line, that's this line. So we're gonna accept the null hypothesis. What's the null hypothesis? I think you, you all know about, okay. Who can help me to define null and alternative hypothesis? These are very important terms, actually. Okay, yeah. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. Basically, my understanding is that null hypothesis is uh, the assumption that there is no uh, significant change, uh, while the alternative hypothesis is the opposite. That's assuming there is a significant uh, change. So let's say if you originally decided the change is coming from A, and what will be our null hypothesis? Stella, well, can, you Stella can you pass me? Okay, sorry. Nope. William, you can't go there. All right, the uh, null hypothesis in that case is, uh, 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 I'm sorry, what was uh, your assumption again? Yeah, uh, let's say, let's from say the from the okay, So from this data, we can easily determine B is better than A, right? Okay. If you look into this slide. Yeah, yes. If we just uh, come up with this decision in Italy, and our hypothesis is just to prove B is exactly better than A, what will be our null hypothesis? The null, the null hypothesis uh, would be uh, either B is less than or greater than the uh, specified value. Uh, if you, you said it's exactly uh, better, so. Uh, it depends on your initial assumption. If you're saying there, uh, the B is uh, greater than A initially, then the null hypothesis would be B is less than or equal to A. So. 
Thanks. Yeah. So, anyone who has objection on his idea? Tadi. Okay. Could you brief it for us? Just uh, well, uh, you uh, to to uh, talk on hypothesis. Yeah. This is of that thing. So, uh, first brief for us, and uh, I will try. You mean the question? Yeah, the question, a little bit. Okay. Yeah, so what I'm asking for is actually, so we run these two variant, and we come up with this conversion rate earlier, before running the test, actually. So when we were using variant A, we were getting 25% conversion. And after the change is made, the conversion pumps up to 70%. So from this, from this, just, I mean, we can see that the change is already only uh, made because of after the variant B changes applied, right? So what will be the construct for the statement that we should start as our null hypothesis? That's the question, actually. Null hypothesis, I think the uh, the variance not significant. It may be. So you mean it's not statistically significant to say the change is coming from variant B, right? That, that is our null hypothesis. And, uh, and later on, we will prove our, uh, the, the alternative hypothesis. The, the alternative hypothesis is the hypothesis which is proved this one. And finally, from the result, we will understand whether B or A is significant. I think the null hypothesis, uh, the deep side, yeah? You say something and uh, you may put different as alternative. Uh, then finally, you are sure that the null hypothesis are falsified. If it is falsified, may be significant as my view from statistical issues. Cool. Let's hear from others too also. I can see Martin and Michael. Uh, okay. Eden. <coughs> Come from Martin, Michael, Eden. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, the non hypothesis is that there is no increase uh, of the conversion rate uh, from B. And then the alternative hypothesis is that there is a conversion rate increase from B. Okay, do you have any different view? Yeah, he just said it, but to paraphrase it, yes. Then our null hypothesis will be the changes made will not affect our, uh, uh, our sample or our variant B. Whereas our alternative will be the change made will affect our variant B. Yes, this Martin has raised it, or it's just, just to paraphrase it. Yeah, thank you. Adam? Um, yeah, it's the same as them. It's uh, the null hypothesis is the position that uh, the change in the variation B would result in no change in the conversion rate whereas the alternative hypothesis would, would result in an improvement in the conversion rate. Okay, so yeah, that's, that's I think, great uh, interpretation. So that's why actually the hypothesis needed. I mean, if we already decided to say the change is bringing the conversion, that's where the blind thinking comes, right? So we wanted to prove that whether change that we are seeing here is coming from, is that because of the real change in the product we made or not? That's the question. So the null hypothesis will be, 
the assumption of no changes affecting like like no changes affecting our conversion rate is then like possible that's the initial assumption we have then we wanted to prove whether the change in b is really bringing this conversion or not that's the main question right so accepting null hypothesis means we are not seeing any change uh, any conversion change because of the data that's coming from uh, the change we made in two variants that's the null hypothesis acceptance but when we reject null hypothesis means it's not completely to say b is uh, better than a unless we do two-sided tests so here also there is two view so we with one sided test it's just trying to see the change is not coming from b that's our hypothesis let's say we wanted to prove b is better than a right so the change is not coming from b is uh, our hype our null hypothesis and we wanted to prove the change is coming from b that is the alternative hypothesis so if we reject our null hypothesis it's not coming If we reject that, that means it could be either coming from A or B, right? If we do two-sided, yeah, we can come up with the real judgment. So yes, it's coming from A or B. But yeah, that's the interpretation is very important for the result, for the hypothesis testing result we come up with. So is that okay, right? The concept behind the two testing ideas. So, yeah, so yeah, I saw one like text in the group about how to compute this log ratio. So I will come back to that in the algorithm part. So with sequential testing in the very beginning, this was actually the initial idea of the sequential, the Ivan Miller simple sequential A-B testing idea. So we pick the sample size and so you try with the link here. That was the one that I shared with you. Then we randomly like pick the data from the sample size we have. We separate the data into like treatment and the control. Then track the incoming success for each treatment. Let's say as T and for the control, let's ask C. So the idea was actually so if the difference reaches two over square root of n, the sample size, stop the test and just design t is greater than c. That was the idea. And if the sum is reaches n, stop the test, just declare no winner. That's the null hypothesis one. Sum is actually the cumulative sum between the data that is coming. That was the initial, the simple test. It works actually in most of the case but it's simple and not usually for the complex problem applying this algorithm may not work but for the two-sided one the only difference is here so if the difference from t to c reaches 2.25 uh, over square root of the sample size stop and go for t which is the treatment one and reverse the uh, competition for the difference and the see it, then the controller will win. Again, the cumulative sum reaches to the sample size when to stop, which is think of this as a truncate rule, when to stop the uh, check, which is end of the data. So stop the test and there is no winner. So in both case, with all the random uh, tests we do from both of that group, we are not seeing any change. That's the simple idea behind. So, but the problem is in this case, we are completely ignoring the uh, failures in each group. We are just looking into the uh, change or all the ones, let's say. So we are just removing all the zeros and just only looking for ones because we focus on the uh, conversion. But we may struggle to get the, the, the factors behind getting the low conversion with this algorithm. But that's why on top of that, while this proposed this probability ratio instead of doing such simple formula to find out we should have 
some log probability ratio formula that allow us to get the expected result. So here I have one for the algorithm. So here is the idea. Let me do the slide show. So in each trial, there are two possibilities, right? So as we said, we have two observations, variant A and variant two observation. Both are converting to the binomial series. Then first we are trying to uh, find out, first we have to compute the apparent lower decision boundaries from the data. There is the formula for that too. Then the aim is just to uh, compute this is three stopping rule in every trial we do. So is, if the lower uh, factor is greater than the upper critical limit that we draw based on the upper uh, boundary, just reject the left hypothesis in the favor of alternative hypothesis. If the uh, lower one is less than or equal to the lower critical limit, accept the Lenite hypothesis, that is no difference one. In between, conduct another trial and continue. If it lies between the two values, top and uh, uh, like bottom values we draw at the very beginning, then just conduct, pick another, continue the test. So to do so, let's say in, the, in our data scenario, we have all yes and no answer data, then we have to convert that into like series of zeros and one. Could it be the conversion, could it be, it depends on the uh, idea you wanted to group your data. Could it be how based day based or could it be impression or auction ID based. So depending on the objective you wanted to group your data, convert that into zeros and one series in different Way. So with, con with uh, conditional SPRT, so we have to take that data, we have to set the statistical parameters, the initial statistical parameters, alpha, beta, and odd ratio. Those are very important. Alpha is actually, what's alpha? One year. Uh -huh. Definitely. Beta is the other one. So one minus alpha is beta, usually. So which is actually the tolerable, the tolerable error we wanted to see. So if, let's say, if it is 0 0.5, so we wanted to, our confidence level will be kind of 95%, right? So we are trying to uh, do the uh, statistical significance test in 95% confidence level, so alpha is 0 0.5. So then we have to calculate the lower and upper critical limits values, the A and the B value. So for each iteration, we do this testing. This is actually what we call the conditional uh, probability test. Given the probability of X, uh, the conditional probability of X1, the trial one, given R, which is the cumulative sum of the two coming data, and N, the sample size state, the number of samples in two observations. So we do this. This is how we uh, apply the conditional probability in each test. That's where the test lies between the upper limit and the lower limit. Then depending on this H node, which is actually the null hypothesis one, either accept this, if it lies in this, the critical limit, this the computation we found, the, the final value we found lies between the uh, below the lower critical limit, go for this decision. And if it is above the upper critical limit, go for the first possible decision, the stopping goals. If it is in between, continue the test. That's how we do the conditional probability test. So all the formula, the detail is implemented in, in your notebook. That's why I'm not going in deep detail, I would like you to read more about this book, if you can. So this is all the initial, uh, I mean, the code is also based on completely this book. Each steps are included in the, in the uh, book itself. You will get each steps and also the definitions, how it is uh, 
described from the book. So yeah, that's the idea behind. So as I said, if it is one-sided test, we only want to compare A to B, not want to compare B to A. But if it is two-sided, so you have to test in both sides and you have to look for greater than the less than side, then you should find the real decision at the end. So the code here, which is included here, is uh, designed for two-sided test and also shows all the steps of conditional sequential probability ratio test. Cool. So yeah, let me just show you some of the component of the code. This is the function uh, that I created for this particular thing. So the owner is I'm um, actually the author is actually the it's named as maker. So just here when I use X is to say experiment group and the Y to say control group. And so the likelihood ratio uh, is to one and error rate alpha and beta. So we also should have truncate after trial stop. So at some time, so there is also the scenario that let's say if we run for a one month long period, if we, uh, we are not able to get the expected uh, stopping rule for like for either of acceptance or rejection of our LL hypothesis, so it will continue running, right? So there should be some rule that uh, force us to truncate the uh, uh, trials. So there is also option which is included here, play with the data code. If you come up with some, like again, nice algorithm that may help the uh, truncation rule, that's nice. But here, what I tried is just defining the maximum number of trial here. If it is, if it reaches, let's say 45, in 45, in the 45th uh, trial, stop the uh, competition. That's the only thing defined here. But there is the concept of truncation, uh, like defining truncate rule for conditional uh, SPRT or overall the SPRT rule, and it's still researching idea. So. Yeah, so here is the, these are the outcome of the final result of the function. So we are nothing doing here, just implementing the, uh, this, the paper that I mentioned here. So we have a number of observations and also just to track, this is actually from code perspective, K is actually just tracking the index where the, the decision made. Let's say if it is in the fifth, index that means we reach into decision in our fifth uh, trial l and you are the upper and lower critical arts this is the decision made then uh, yeah this is the truncation truncate rule also and also there is original data the x1 the cumulative sum between the two data series coming and uh, yeah r is the cumulative sum between x and y X1 is only for the exposed group. And these are the, the log probability ratio results of the series, each trial. This is actually the final, there is a turning value that, I mean, the results that we found for the competition. That these are the limits, the apparent lower limits, the boundary decisions that we computed in every step. So yeah, this is the code that helps you to uh, Calculate it. So I just named the functions with the exact name of uh, the like formula in the book. So if it's named as G in the book in the formula, I used as G here also just to compute. If it's named as H, I used as H. So I read it. When you also revise the book, you will easily understand what it means. The code, how it's computed here. So yeah. So this is actually all the idea behind the code, but the important thing is this one. So the data given to you is, it looks like uh, it's a kind of data frame. So I could say uh, these are not relevant for sequential testing, but you may use this for your machine learning part. Just focus on converting these zeros and ones to series 
this function helps you to convert taking this and uh, like converting it into zeros and one series. So try this one also. I know it may not be easy for you to understand the conversion behind how we do this. So reach out to me if you confuse this, how it's converting. I try to add description here. Mm, yeah, you can also try it. So well, we just take this yes and no, and this experiment group, that's enough for now. Then let's say, so here when I call about engagement, it's, it's just the uh, zeros and the ones value here, the converted one. When I call about yes, it's just to say all ones. So, so here in, in this one, let's say in the, uh, so we create two data frame with kind of very low series, the zeros and the one for positive and zero for the negative. And let's say given the engagement, sum of years, number of until current observations uh, in the array, just let's say this is five, three, and three means. So we are actually showing we have uh, like three ones. Uh, so three ones and let's, let's say this is a kind of series that we generated. So here it's showing the binary array of five plus three plus three value of which two of the first five are ones. So if you just pick the first five, two of it is one, and the one of the next three are ones, and all of the last three are in the position of uh, like. So this is, if you, if you take this five, three, two, so it's just to show zeros, three, three zeros, three ones at the end, then from five, you, this five will help you to compute the yes value here. So just two ones, then one zero, then three ones. That's how it's uh, computed actually. So it will, it will transform the data. Uh, you have to transform the data in a way that's here I show in, in the series, you could come up with some different algorithm too, but it should be ones and a zero series. While you do this, you have to bring two arrays with equal size. Those equal size you mean, so let's say our experiment group data is with 100 rows and the control group is 50. You can't easily truncate it at the 50 uh, for the uh, experiment one. That means you are losing the information. It was run for assuming that the, we run these two variants for equal days, let's say for all five, five days to come up with that data. And fortunately, variant A got a lot of data uh, size because of multiple viewers and variant B was limited. So if you are truncating for the one with minimum size, you are losing information of the one with maximum. So you should come up with the solution that hold all the information in both of the data frame and convert that into series of Vernoli's. Then this algorithm takes that and do all the expected competition. And also you are not expected to understand the mathematics behind each of the function here. That's not part of the evaluation too. The only thing needed is convert this, understand the code, convert it into a modular way, bring the data, pass through it, add this into your pipeline that you design for all the machine learning, the conventional and the sequential uh, data analytics. And once that all is um, like added into pipeline, run it, test it, then all the extra thing is the addition, the bonus thing. So if you come up with nice truncation rule, if you come up with uh, like converting all the functions into something that's more understandable, that's all the addition. I did this purposely just to, it's not structured. Even if you look into some of the core, like, like loops and also the conditions, there are, it's not that much efficient way. 
it's because you are expected to convert the code. So there is one uh, idea in industry. So you are not usually start from the scratch to build something. Rather, there is something that someone did already. You took that, work on that, add some uh, efficiency stuff, and uh, integrate with the working algorithm, present that. That's the idea. So just to uh, practice you with some challenging thing in the industry. So, so we try to define all the code in this way. So that's the idea behind this uh, algorithm and the notebook. So let me know if you get stuck to understand some concepts behind so that we can discuss and uh, further, I will further explain it via some kind of conversation channel. So yeah, that's all. Thanks, Marty. Uh, thank you for the uh, for the for, for taking us through. It's uh, it's been really good. Uh, so I had two questions. Uh, the mm -hmm. first one was uh, concerning the calculation of the likelihood ratio. Uh, I still haven't yet uh, understood how it's calculated. Then the second one, in the particular the source code that uh, that uh, you have shared. I was trying to look for mm -hmm. that function called uh, print log, uh, and I was uh, wondering where it was because uh, uh, I wasn't able to find it. Yeah. Pardon, what was your next question? The second one I heard. The, the first one is just algorithm behind like do ratio computation, right? Yeah. Then the second one was the print log uh, function inside the that uh, <laughs> the code. Yeah, I was trying to look for it, uh, where it's been implemented, but uh, I wasn't uh, finding it. Mm, print log. Yeah, I'm fine, trying to find it. Let me share it again, maybe you can point it. Maybe, Bidia, is, is that a different question? Yeah, mine is uh, different. Simple one. Uh, how do we calculate or I don't uh, minimum detect or detect? Is it something we just arbitrarily decide, or is there a way of calculating? Okay. So for the sequential testing, we don't need any MLE there. We are just expected to bring the data, do the old dipod. That's actually the aim behind minimizing that old issue. The minimum detectable effect is uh, usually needed when you are dealing with. Oh, sorry. We have some. We have some I don't know. But yeah, I have to jump into that too. But yeah that is needed for the actually for the conventional algorithm that you are working with so the link that i shared with you in the upper in the top uh, there is a list kind of menu list so there you will get how to come up with all the possible options and also the suggestions how to use the absolute and relative way to find this minimum detectable effect it's actually kind of the smallest effect that will be detected in like just one minus the beta value of the time nothing so try to uh, play with that link that i shared then you can find it okay thank you Any other question? I have to jump into another one too, but okay. Yeah, I, I mean, for the uh, who, Martin, I have updated it. I, I missed it to include the print log function, so I just changed it to the regular print one. So, no worries for that. But for the log ratio calculation, I will send you the slide also. With, uh, maybe I can give that to Everest and he can share that all with you, both the slide and the notebook. There you will see how it's calculated the 
to isolate the group of users who are not uh, respond to the questionnaire uh, in order to go for the coming A-B testing analysis. So we yeah, have from users. the data you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there is a column actually that allow you to identify which one is coming for exposed and which one is coming for control. So you can you have to identify you have to group that too, even for Machine learning. For machine learning, you may use it as it is, but but for the other one, you have to separate it. But we have users which are uh, not categorized. Uh, I mean, which are not voted for yes or no. Uh, both of the uh, the rows are uh, zero, and so are we supposed to isolate those users? I mean, they they saw the uh, the questionnaire, but they failed to respond it. That's actually the main part of data. But when you are data analyst, before doing such analysis, like plain uh, sequential testing, you have to find out all the anomalies in the data and the filter out. So is it that either intentionally added or is that uh, something that you have to uh, consider, test it, add it, see the difference, how, why that's happening. So if it is zero, zero, zero in both cases, that means for this particular scenario, it may not be useful, right? So yeah, think of that actually. That's part of data preparation that you do. Okay, thanks. Great, I have to jump. Maybe Everest, I will meet you once I uh, complete the other meeting, then share with you all the document at hand. Thank you all for the watching and with being with me. Thank you, Abeb. I appreciate your time. And uh, yeah, uh, I guess it's, it's the end. Uh, maybe if you can share the, the document after, then I will share. Sure, yeah, in five minutes. I will. Yes. Thanks. Thanks so much.